Welcome to Pixel Fondue. We are live here today with four members from the foundry. Uh, it's the 11 Moto 11 point or 11.2 V1 uh, released today. And so that's been in beta a little for a while now, but it is out today. So we're going to talk a little bit about the features. Uh, we've got Shane with the glasses there, of course. Everybody knows Shane is the senior product manager for Moto. And right next to Shane is Ed. Ed is Ed Ferrari. Ed is, we've now started calling Ed the Moto Concierge, I believe. So, yeah. so if you uh, have questions on Moto, Ed is all over the place on Slack and the forums and Facebook. Um, especially if you're trying Moto out for the first time or 10th time, Ed is there to answer questions, get you started. He'll answer your, you know, look at your scene. Come over to your house, walk your dog, <laughs> make a picture of margaritas while you learn how to use uh, booleans, whatever. So that's my reward. That's my reward. That's, the that's picture yeah. reward. Those those are all true things. Yeah. <laughs> we do <laughs> charge the margaritas though. Yeah. We charge, charge for margaritas. All right, that's good. All right. Well, it takes tips at least. All right. And then, uh, next to Ed, we got Derek Cicero, the head of design products in Moto. And next to him, the legendary Andy Brown, now the design lead. I like the sound of that, design lead for Moto, chilling Sounds in good. England, where it is now dinner time, I believe, I asked, 6 o'clock. So, yeah. all right. Have you eaten yet, or are you waiting till after the podcast? Not yet. I'm, I'm a little bit grumpy. A little bit grumpy. All right. All right. As you can tell, yeah. a little bit grumpy. <laughs> Um, all right, so today let's just kind of set the agenda here. We're going to talk obviously about 11.2. Derek is going to, or not Derek, uh, Shane's going to go through some features. Andy and Ed are going to um, go ahead and, and demo a few things and we'll do a little back and forth. I do want to bring in some comments and questions from the community as well. So I'll keep an eye on the chat window, which I should probably open up so I can keep an eye on it. And then we'll have uh, Derek. I suppose you'll want to have a couple of things you want to chat about as well. Derek, do you want to kind of kick us off, or did you want to uh, have Shane just jump into 11.2? Yeah, I'll have Shane kind of just get right right into it, and we can kind of talk about some of the um, kind of longer-term stuff at the end. Okay, sounds good. So 11.2 available today, uh, the third and last iteration of the Moto 11 series. So if you all remember, Moto's gone to a different sort of release schedule. And I think, uh, judging from the community response, I think it's been a good uh, success. I, I really think it was a, a great idea to move to this um, shorter schedule between releases, uh, sort of faster iterations, a lot of work on just stability, bug fixing, usability, these sorts of, in addition, there's tons of new features in 11.2, but um, these types of things coming out very quickly every few months. And, and in addition to public betas coming out as well, if you're a subscription or, a, or an owner of Moto. So Shane, why don't you just go ahead? So jump in and, and tell us what we're going to see in 11.2 today. Yeah, so that's that's kind of the key thing, um, which we, we do intend to keep rolling forward. I mean, we started this kind of pattern in the 10 series, as you know, last year uh, with the three releases a year. Uh, we started to spread things out a bit more in the year um, across a four to five month cadence. Um, so um, I think in, in general, you can kind of look to expect that as, as we move forward, um, these are going to be the rough timings, um, at least what you know, Derek and I are, are mapping out and planning as we move forward into the 12 series. It's, it's kind of the, the same strategy again. Um, the overall arching strategy to the 11 series this year uh, was still continuing to, to work a lot on just the basics of the product and making sure that everything that we're known for and known to be really good at is functioning at a very high level. Um, and we're continuing to push that innovation edge in those areas. So uh, throughout the year, you've seen us do a, a, a numerous amount of things around uh, UV editing, uh, polygon workflows, whether it be mesh fusion um, or just regular direct modeling. Um, or the procedural modeling uh, features that we introduced last year have continued uh, to further enhance throughout the year. So lots and lots of uh, great asset creation uh, tools throughout the entire series. Um, and 11.2, uh, you know, no shortage of that. There's, uh, you know, a lot of really great stuff um, in there and UV editing in particular in, in this, uh, this release around. Um, and then uh, we've continuously chipped away at performance issues um, and working with larger and larger scenes um, inside of Moto. So there's been a lot of improvements with uh, replicator performance, uh, you know, locator performance, uh, rigging performance, uh, and animation deformation performance. 
Um, so we've uh, done some things, uh, come to kind of some subtle things as you go. Um, but if you haven't been, if you're on, a, say, an 801 or a 901, uh, the impact is, is pretty significant. There's quite a bit that's gone into uh, really the last six releases around that area. So performance in general uh, continues to uh, chip away and become better and better. Um, so you, and, if I could ahead. just interrupt you here, and so you had mentioned in past live streams that that's exactly the type of thing you were planning on doing prior to releasing new animation features was to improve performance, uh, you know, the mini item performance issues Moto has had in the past where you have a lot of items in the scene, uh, rigging, deformation, you've uh, got caches in there now and things like that. And so it sounds like, you know, these are the type of uh, features and a lot of uh, labor going into this product. Um, that is sort of setting the stage maybe for some future releases, but stuff you had nuts and bolts stuff you had to get done first. Exactly. I mean, there's and there's just an abundance of the nuts and bolts stuff uh, throughout the series this year. Um, and, you know, as we started to kind of, I wouldn't say wind down those efforts, but we've kind of reached uh, the horizon, if you will, to a certain extent of what we wanted to achieve there. Um, so you've started to see us transition now into uh, the more bigger ticket feature development. Um, and we started to release those earlier into the process. So we now have Moto VR in beta, uh, the AMD Pro render, uh, which is a new GPU render, which will, will come out in beta uh, hopefully later this month or next later month. Later this month. All right. I was yeah. going to ask about that. All right. Yeah. So the, those types of things are now in development. These are bigger ticket, new feature things that will become a real deal next year, but we're trying to get our customers earlier access to that stuff and be more part of that development process. So um, in, in essence, there's probably gonna be fewer big surprises as we move forward. So that might be a bit of a disappointment um, and a bit of a challenge for us to deal with on the marketing side, uh, to be honest with you. But um, overall, I think it's a good thing to, to have our customers more aware um, and more a part of you know what we're doing as we roll forward. So. Well, it, it's fun to drop surprises on people, and, and they're probably more interesting to market and give you more sort of meat to grab onto from the marketing and advertising standpoint. But honestly, customers want to know what they're getting because we have to make business decisions um, about the tools that we use. And for instance, you mentioned uh, ProRender. Knowing that GPU rendering is coming to Moto makes me feel comfortable with a GPU purchase or something like that, where just being happily surprised, you know, out of the blue may be fun, but it's not something you really can plan for or prepare for. So I think it's great that you're laying everything out, you're laying things out on the table. Of course, there'll be some surprises, some, you know, you're not laying out every single feature you do. Yeah. Um, but it's great to know that you've got VR, you've been working on VR stuff for over a year. You've got pro render stuff coming out. I also noticed that you're continuing to uh, work on the sort of pipeline tools of Moto, the IO. Like people don't realize, well, they probably do realize, but you know, FBX has to be updated probably every single version because Autodesk is constantly changing that. So <laughs> you have to update FBX. There's Alembic improvements I've noticed. Uh, Unreal, the Unreal bridge it looks like has uh, some new, quite a few new features as well. So yeah, um, exactly. So that was my fourth major bullet, you know, for what we we're, were targeting and what we achieved this year was a lot of uh, file I/O improvements, and and they were pretty significant. Um, the improvements to Alembic alone uh, were substantial. You know, we had uh, file transfers and file loads in Katana, for example, when we exported a, a Moto Alembic file and loaded that in Katana. Um, you know, prior to the Eleven series, you know, some of those files were taking overnight to load. And now we're loading literally in <laughs> seconds. You know, in 10, 15 seconds, the same file is loading just because the data is structured better. Um, well, and now is this the difference between streaming a 10 gigabyte Olympic file versus trying to load the thing in? Some of it was that, and some of it was just really, honestly, bad code to begin with. And so, <laughs> we, you know, significantly gone in. We went deep with uh, particular customers on that project. We worked a lot with Boxel, which was doing a lot of uh, what I would consider high-end, uh, you know, Olympic file caches and transfers of, of lots of different things between lots of different applications. Um, and we, you know, we put our developers, you know, on call with them and we went deep and we, we worked out a lot of significant issues in tough areas with a lot of those file I.O. 
uh, format. So you're so you're working with a number of your your customers who have uh, big problems, and being able to solve big problems for big customers filters down to smaller customers. But you also have obviously you're part of the foundry, and you have uh, other very talented groups of programmers there. You mentioned Katana, which would rely heavily on Alembic, I would think, as well as Nuke. So is there a good amount of back and forth between Moto developers and the Katana group or the Nuke group and, and solving these sort of uh, pipeline problems? There definitely is. And probably one of the, you know, the biggest talking points uh, to that is the new uh, bridge format that was developed between Moto and Unreal. Um, this was a, you know, a new kind of live link network protocol client server type of relationship uh, that we feel is really very unique out there in the marketplace today. And that was actually developed as part of a research project for, uh, I don't remember what um, investment it was, um, but it was, a, it was a community research project that the Foundry contributed to. And the Moto team kind of latched onto it and said, hey, well, we can leverage this not only you know, uh, for Moto, but let's, let's plug it into Unreal as well. And let's connect um, you know, a very rich live connection between Moto and Unreal. Um, so that's something that we're building on as a team, as a company, um, and we plan to leverage that throughout other products, um, you know, within the portfolio and then outside the portfolio. You know, we could do live connections to, you know, obviously Unity would be an, another logical one, um, but you know, who knows? Substance, ZBrush, uh, potentially even Maya. You know, we're we're looking at all different fronts of how we can. You know, sit well in the pipeline with all these other tools that are. Well, on. the live connections are something I'm really interested in, and, and just going back to Olympic for one second, I want to get back to the live connections. But you know, I think a lot of people, uh, you know, Olympic's been around for a while now, but I do see a lot of people still using MDD, and it's great that MDD is supported on Moto. Uh, but I'm telling you, Olympic is much faster. So if you're out there still using MDD. Even if you have a lot of MD, MDD files you have from previous projects, you can you can load up an MDD file or apply an MDD deformation to a, a mesh in Moto, save that out as an Alembic file, and it's going to run about three times as fast. Also, Alembic caches really nicely with uh, with the new caching system in Moto. I, uh, one of the Pixel Fondue, Steve White, one of the Pixel Fondue contributors, had loaded up an exploding bridge scene um, into Alembic, and I. Uh, cached it and it played back. I think when I turned off, uh, well, played back a solid 30 frames per second. When I turned off um, the frame rate uh, inhibitor, it, it played back, I think, like 120 frames per second or something. You know, I think it was around 200,000 polygons or 150,000 polygons, Olympic file, you know, uh, every single frame. So it's a great format. It's sort of been adopted as at least this, the current standard for streaming, it seems like. And uh, I know that there's some devs at the Foundry who put a ton of work into it. So check it out. It's real simple to export Olympic out of Maya. Um, in terms of uh, the, the like the, the connection apps, I, I want to bring up um, uh, uh, Pixel Fondue contributor who, uh, 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 oh, geez, why am I blanking on your name? You're going to kill me. Um, uh, Emmanuel, because he spells it with a Y. <laughs> Emmanuel. Uh, created the uh, uh, Substance Painter uh, live connection with Moto, Maya, Blender. But it w I guess what I'm getting at is you're not just creating this sort of one-off connections. It's an API, correct, Shane? So is that something that uh, somebody like Emmanuel can get into and maybe improve his connection or make new connections today, with? Today, no. But uh, you know, we, we do have intentions to opening that up. But the reason not to open it up now is is it's not solidified. So there's a lot of things still changing with the API that it would really be bad for us to put it out there because um, uh, they're, they're still working on what is the, the foundational structure of that um, and for us to be least disruptive to others that have built on top of it, we need to kind of keep it black box uh, for the moment. Uh, but the, there is all the best of intentions of kind of making that a more kind of open format. Nice, okay. Uh, anything else you want to talk about in terms of new features? You mentioned there's a ton of UV features uh, in 11.2. Anything in particular you want to jump on, or you want to let Ed and... Um, and I'll probably let the real experts talk to a lot of the more specifics on that stuff. Um, I will just say, you know, probably my, my favorite feature of the release is the new uh, cloud-based preset browser um, that I, I believe we even talked to you and Yazan and, and quite a few others out in the community about. Uh, and what this is is just a, a much more direct um, in-product connection to the, the asset share site. It's been a you know a real positive asset to the product for many many years. 
Um, it kind of went away as we, we switched over to the new community site. Um, and we're, we've kind of relaun relaunched it, if you will, today in a big way with it now, not only being live again on the site, um, but also uh, in product where you can directly access those assets, drag and drop them into your scene um, and load that content into your, in, into your scene. The cool thing is that, you know, we're teaming up with uh, other partners like William and, and many others out there uh, to allow them to put their content there as well. So, um, you know, we have a lot of free plugins and things like that that don't get a lot of traction because they're hard to find. So we're putting that more in the face of the users, making it more accessible and uh, just more, yeah. more aware, if you will. I think that's a critical step. I mean, it's really one that was probably a long time in coming. If you look even, you know, Adobe has done this across their product line. Uh, if you jump into something like, if you use Unity, the asset store, uh, basically a cloud-based asset browser is critical for any sort of application today. And being able to get third-party content up there, whether it's free or even, I'd love to see people be able to sell their stuff up there eventually. Like I, there's a couple new plugins, uh, kids released uh, just recently by Mario Baldi. There's a really cool tracer one. I'll put a link up on Pixel Fondue. Uh, there's another one, uh, Poly Strips from Hair. And so guys like that who are just you know kicking ass, like creating this stuff, it's great to get that accessible to everybody from within the program. Um, I also really like what you've done with the uh, startup screen in Moto. I noticed there, in fact, the poly strips from here, I just saw, I loaded up 11.2 <laughs> this morning and I saw, you know, like you can get to mob billion, billions or, or the new, you know, plugins coming generally from community members. I mean, that's where a lot of these kits are coming from and they're right there. When you load up Moto, you can see what's new. I think that was a great idea. Well, and that is, I mean, that's kind of, this is sort of the 1.0 version of, of that and where we want to go, obviously, you know, next year and beyond is really to push that because you're right. First of all, people don't always have the ability to kind of go out on online, find stuff. So if you're in the app, we can push content to you. Uh, absolutely push stuff from the community, you know, from, from kind of partners. The idea also being that we can start to push training down as we kind of maybe know more about what you're interested in and, and what you're focused on, start to target that more. If, you know, you're more on the game side or on the design side, start to actually push, um, you know, content and training specific to where you're going and really make that in-app experience a lot more um, compelling and interesting. Uh, and ideally, you know, as you're coming into the app each time, kind of, you know, update that and driving that so I think it's a huge opportunity for us and you're right I mean we'd love to see as part of that monetizing the community more so people who are out there in the community selling selling content selling training potentially selling kits and plugins can kind of reach that audience more uh, more easily yeah I totally agree I think that's uh, where the things are going you want a material you don't need to jump out of the internet and start digging around you just open up your cloud-based browser search for uh, satin gold and there's like 10 different ones right there and you just pick the one you want if you want to buy one you want one for free whatever I think that's where that's going so I'm glad that's being is is in there now and, it, and that it's not you know just a one-off checklist it's something you're going to continuously develop um, okay well why don't uh, there's some questions popping up over here so right now let's just talk about the cloud browser real quick uh, Shane so if I install 11.2 um, do I automatically, do I have to set anything up to get the browser uh, connected to the right internet site or is no, it? No, you don't have to really do anything. It's just the regular asset browser. Um, and it'll now have uh, basically another menu tree for cloud assets. Um, so it'll, it already has like a pre-cached uh, directory of, of everything that's there. Um, but it'll update itself on, you know, upon launch, um, and when you go into particular areas, it'll it'll kind of kind of constantly keep updating itself as you navigate through things. So somebody on the uh, chat over here, just been Jonathan uh, Colder, just uh, Colder. Sorry, Jonathan. I get worse at pronouncing. Yeah. Cold. Yeah. So you mentioned something that's important, I think, and and we, you know, you're going to need some quality control on a cloud, you know, asset list like that, and and I think robust tagging, so we can search for things. Yeah. Um, I, do we have some filters there so we don't get 37 types of really bad concrete textures or something? <laughs> is there a, is there a, uh, you know, I think it's, a, you know, in, in the state that it's at now, it's as good as it was. Um, so let's kind of, you know, be honest with each other. And, and that's, you know, what was there and what was capable in the asset share cycle for is, is there now and you can continue to filter based on those same things. That same data is still there. 
Um, there is a lot of old data that needs to, you know, get purged out over time. But uh, for right now, we've just kind of opened the portal, if you will. Um, and we, we definitely have a lot of uh, hopes and uh, you know, ambitions to continue to refine how you work with that data, how that data works for you. You know, the most common things presented first are, um, you know, hey, you grab this. A lot of other people grab this as well when they did that, you know, that, that type of, uh, you know, full yeah. on, you know, learning code system, you know, could be applied to this. And you may be able to tap uh, the Moto community a little bit and crowdsource some something like this, where I think there are, there's probably just like some sometimes you have community members who help moderate forums or things like that. You might be able to tap some community members to curate some of the content or provide you guys with some info to you know you know brush comb through there every once in a while or make sure things are tagged correctly. Yeah, maybe yeah. might be something to think about. Ed, maybe that's that's something you could like reach out to some you know some of the Moto knots out there. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. We definitely could use the help <laughs> with that because that's a there's um, you know tens of thousands of assets there today and it definitely it needs to be purged. Tens of thousands, you heard that community. <laughs> we need somebody to go through that. Maybe you'll get a I don't know free subscription to Mari. I'm just throwing that out there. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Well, Ed, maybe you want to jump in. Uh, there's a bit a ton, by the way, of mesh fusion improvements. So one of the things that uh, Shane mentioned, really the most important thing he mentioned right off the bat is. Moto is continuing to play to its strengths, right? So its strengths as a asset creation tool, as a renderer, um, these are things that that every Moto user uses Moto for. Some people expand beyond that, use it for a lot of animation like I do, but everybody uses Moto for its core strengths. These core strengths are being improved in every version. Mesh, there has not been a version yet that didn't have a handful of mesh fusion improvements. So I know Daryl and, and uh, is it Boris? Yes. Our, our work uh, continuously pouring a ton of effort into Mesh Fusion. There's some really awesome stuff in Mesh Fusion uh, coming out. So, Ed, is that what you're going to show us some Mesh Fusion stuff? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, as Greg mentioned, there's a ton of Mesh Fusion improvements. Um, there's a long awaited improvement. Uh, it's the feature enhancement that involves edge weighting for Mesh Fusion. So, that's finally supported by Mesh Fusion now, which is really huge. It's incredible. Clapping. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so that's a big deal. <laughs> So let me share my screen. I'm going to play a video. Uh, can you guys see my screen? It's a, yes. it's a video of Moto? OK. Great. So this has no sound, so I'll just narrate over this. Uh, I have two cubes here, and they're both just six-faced cubes. I'm just going to take one of them and press Shift-Tab to go into uh, Catmull Clark sub-D mode. I'm going to select uh, the top edges for one of the cubes, and I'll hide the other cube. And I'm just going to press Shift-W to bring up the Vertex Map Weight tool, which everyone should be familiar with. So. If I adjust the weight, you can see here in the tool properties, we have a 20% weight. And at 20% weight, you can see that we have maximum uh, creasing going on here. So these selected edges can't get uh, any more hardened than they already are. And let's just quickly review kind of uh, how edge creasing works with standard Catmull Clark subdivision surfaces. So if I come over to these surface uh, properties, we can see that the subdivision level is two. So with a level of two, the weight of 20% gives us maximum creasing. If I were to increase that level to something like six, watch the edges. They become uh, softened. And that's because we have to compensate by increasing the weight percentage. So if I bring that up to 60%, which you can see here, uh, it's now at maximum creasing. So there's a direct correlation between the subdivision level and the uh, weight percentage. And I'm bringing this up because Mesh Fusion works a little bit differently. It kind of streamlines it. It makes it a little bit um, more simple. So I did not know that, by the way. So really? I don't think I'm the only one. So. Well, I didn't know it until you know uh, maybe a few months ago. So it's just, yeah, there's a direct correlation there. So if you have a level of 3, you would need a weight of 30% on your edges to kind of reach maximum creasing. So oops, I think I skipped ahead a little bit. Let me just. There we go. OK, so I'll just set this back down to a level of two. And just trying to get back to where I was. So we, for a level of two, we only need uh, a weight of 20%. And if I bring that down to like 17% or 15%, you can see the edges starting to soften a little bit. Um, so that's how it's controlled regularly. Now, if I go into items mode and set this uh, mesh, which is still a cube, keep in mind, if I set this to uh, be the primary uh, in a new fusion setup, or let me just actually add some more weighting here really quickly. Um, 
this will actually be our new primary. So control F brings up our fusion pie menu. I'll choose new fusion with selected. And you can see the green wireframe is our primary. So that represents the mesh that we just worked on. This triangulated sphere is the fusion item. So you might be saying, hey, I thought the whole point of this was because fusion um, supports edge weighting now. So why aren't we seeing it? Well, we actually have to come over to the fusion item itself and in the properties enable edge weights in the fusion mesh section. Once we do that, we can start to see the edge weighting kind of pop in. So that's pretty cool. Um, now you might notice that the edge weighting isn't really, it's a little bit soft. So this is what I was talking about when I said we're now working on a 0 to 100 scale with the percentage. So now a 0% will be totally uh, smooth or softened. And as we approach 100%, it will start to kind of be completely hardened or creased. So right now we're at 50% and you can see the kind of uh, effect we're getting. Now, uh, just let me uh, pause sure. it for one second here, because people might be wondering. I'm guessing that there's probably a slightly different uh, uh, smoothing algorithms between a, a mesh fusion item, which is a, sort of a proprietary item that was invented by uh, uh, Boris and Daryl over there, and just a standard Cabell Clark sub D. There, that is that the difference between the edge weighting percentages? Well, yeah, absolutely. It's taking it's taking the Cabell Clark sub D as uh, a source, and the fusion procedural item is taking the weighted information, and it's actually creating uh, actual edge loops that support the, uh, they're actually, it's actually adding edge loops on each side of the uh, of the edge. So that's actually what I'm showing here. Oh, yeah, uh, you can see them. Yeah, you can see them right here. So that's, uh, right now, we're actually getting uh, two rows of, or two loops on each side. And that's actually controllable also in the properties. And that's what I'm going to show next. Uh, you can see right here, the weight loop type, by default, it's set to double loops. So if I uh, if I zoom in here, you can see that there's actually two loops on either side. I can change that to single loops, and that makes it slightly less dense. So now we only have one loop on either side of the weighted edges, and that's only happening on the weighted edges. Uh, there's a third option for adaptive loop count, and that will just allow Mesh Fusion to kind of determine which works better, double loops or single loops for the weighted edges. So I tend to stay with double loops, especially with uh, simple forms like this. I mean, again, this is just a cube. I'm going to keep reiterating that because it's amazing what you can do with uh, you know, very simple primitives. So I'm going to bring in the second cube here. And I'm just going to set it to Catmull Clark sub D by pressing Shift tab. And then I'll move it so that it overlaps this primary. And this is going to be a subtractive element. But first, I'm just going to uh, scale it a little bit. So it's it, it kind of takes a bite out of the primary. So it just takes out a little bit more. So it needs to be a little bit bigger. And I'll just uh, drag it onto the primary. And from the menu, I'll choose Fusion, Apply, Subtract. So now you can see uh, the subtraction happening. And if I just reposition that, the Fusion is updating in real time. So that's really nice. And I can return to the primary, and I can select these edges. And I can still uh, update the, the edge weighting. So now I can reduce it to 10. So we have a, a more round kind of bottom shape here. Gives Very a little cool. bit more of a pear shape, yeah. And uh, I can also change the edge weighting for the uh, for the subtractive element as well. Basically, any edge can be uh, weighted now. So you can see kind of what we're getting here in the corner. Oh, yeah. So if you're, yeah. if you're new to Mesh Fusion, and let me just throw this out there some, for sure. some people who may not be familiar with it. Um, you know, the, the source items have been, you see the display properties have changed to just this green and pink wireframe overlay. There's still the same Mesh items there. It's just that the display properties are changed. Also, it's a fully procedural item. So if, if Ed were to open up, it's very, you know, the way I work in Mesh Fusion is, is how Ed just showed it here. I just drag and drop and select, you know, add or subtract or whatever. It's super easy. Um, but it's building a schematic uh, node network uh, in the background, which you can actually, you know, jump into at any time and, and uh, rewire or even add procedural mesh ops to your source items if you want to. Oh, yeah, completely. Yeah, and the edge weighting, especially the new implementation, is completely compatible with the uh, mesh operations that were released in the 10 series. So if, if I move along here, you can see that I'm, I'm still adjusting these, uh, these weights for these selected edges. And I'm just going to uh, adjust the primary a little bit. And I'll just scale this up. And it's really, this is all about form exploration at this point. You just keep in mind that these are essentially two cubes that I'm working working with two uh, different mesh items that both contain six-sided uh, or six-faced, you know, cubes. Uh, but the the variety of shapes I can get with this is really incredible. Now, we, we're seeing some faceting here, and that's because, as I mentioned, uh, at its core, these are just, you know, cubes. So I'm just going to increase the fusion subdivs, which will 
kind of procedurally subdivide the source meshes. So if I just continue to adjust this a little bit, I'm going to do something which I like to do, and I've done previously uh, with Mesh Fusion. I hollow out the primary so we can have kind of like a, a hollowed out form, and I'm going to use the procedural system uh, in Modo. Uh, but I'm going to do it in kind of an interesting way. So I'll select this empty mesh item, and I'm going to come over to the Mesh Ops tab. And I'll add an operator. It's just going to be a simple merge meshes mesh op, which is like uh, uh, Moto's procedural way of duplicating items. And the source for this merge mesh is going to be the primary. So we're using the primary mesh, but this time we're going to use it as uh, a subtractive element. So it's going to cut away or hollow out our form. I also need a push influence because uh, it needs to be a little bit smaller than the primary so that it doesn't completely obliterate uh, the additive or primary uh, mesh. So I have the distance set to negative 115 millimeters. That just scales it down a little bit. And then I'm going to drag it from the item list onto the primary item. And that gives us the hollowing out effect. Now, what's nice so, about this... Oh, go ahead, Craig. So I'm just going to go over that one more time for the people who are, who are watching who aren't familiar with uh, mesh operations or, or mesh fusion. As, you know, essentially, again, what Ed just did is he took the primary, that uh, the shape there, piped it into a, a new mesh item, and so if you change the primary, that cutout will change with it. And oh, yeah. just, uh, pushed it down a little bit and cut away. So he's using the same base shape, copied into a new item, pushed down a little bit, and using it as a subtract operation to create that hollow out, hollow out section there. It's really cool. Now, when you go ahead, I, I'm guessing you're going to move the primary around, and you, it'll all will work, work out uh, perfectly. Yeah, totally. I just uh, moved some of the elements of the primary around. But more importantly, I'm about to start uh, adjusting the edge weighting of the primary. And the inside, the hollow aspect, will follow along, because the hollow aspect is actually sourcing the primary. So here, I've selected the bottom uh, edges. And as I weight them with Shift W, you can see the inside changing as well. Uh -huh. So that the cutter object, which is just a a you know the the primary piped into a new item, is is obviously changing right along with the primary. So you just have to change one item there. Exactly. And, you, uh, you you make changes to one, and it, the other follows along, goes along for the ride. So yeah, this, this would be good for boats, shoes, and I mean I'm using the the bare minimum of of what we could possibly use, just cubes. So when this is all said and done, I literally have 18 polygons that are in play, and that's responsible for this form. Because you have to keep in mind, these aren't what I'm mousing over right now. They're not actual polygons. Because this is procedural, uh, there's just really no no overhead here. I'm really just adjusting 18 polygons to get this this form. And it's, it's essentially resolution independent. You can increase the subdivision level, get finer edges on that thing. Um, you can also, it also is really fast. Like, you know, you would think mesh fusion would be slow because you're doing Boolean operations on subdivision surfaces. And there, it looks like there's a ton of polygons involved, but it, it's, a, it's really fast. It's as fast or faster than just regular polygonal Boolean operations in most packages. Oh, totally. So I've selected all of the uh, fusion source items, which there's only three. And in the bottom right here, you can see in the HUD, 18 polygons. So that's what I was talking about. These are all of the polygons that are uh, kind of coming together to create this form. Um, and I'm not even using, I haven't updated the strips. So, you know, the strips in Mesh Fusion are incredibly powerful. Um, I'm not using, there's nothing stopping me from using traditional uh, bevel operations, just bevel uh, modeling on this. But I just, just for the sake of it, I'm just using only um, edge weighting. Right, and you can add additional uh, mesh operations on there, or just do additional direct modeling. It's all going to update in real time. Um, that also looks like a boat I made when I was four years old. <laughs> like wooden, yeah, well, <laughs> maybe a wooden shoe. I don't know. I think you guys have a new shoe program. A clog, yeah. Do you have any? Uh, a clog. <laughs> clog. clog. Yeah, they wouldn't. Uh, what is is that? That's uh, the Netherlands, right? Somebody from yep. Europe. <laughs> <laughs> So, right. I, I just want to jump in and say one thing, which is, um, you know, Ed is just doing a great job on this. And this is a lot of what he's doing kind of as the Moto Concierge, sort of what his role is, is as people have questions, if you're trialing 11.2, if you're, you know, new to Moto or you're looking to upgrade and you have questions, how do I do this? How do I set this up? And I think even you had said earlier, Greg, that, you know, there's things that you, you didn't know. If you have questions, not only will Ed kind of answer them on Slack, on the forums, he, he, he can do video examples, which he's been doing a great job of, putting them on Moto Geeks TV, putting them out on Facebook. Um, and Ed's just been doing a fantastic job of really answering questions so people can kind of unlock the, the power that's in the application. Because a lot of this stuff, 
it's there and folks just don't know. They don't know how easy it is to access some of this stuff. And so um, I really encourage people, you know, download the, if, if you're not on Moto already, download the trial, ask it a question. And uh, if, if you like what you see here, uh, he's got a lot more of it. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm not afraid to make a quick video for somebody, a custom video. You know, hopefully it's something that we can share with, uh, you know, the broader community. I Ultimately, I, I tend to get the same questions uh, over and over again. So it, it is nice to kind of uh, take some of the, the material that I do for certain uh, trialists and just release it for the, the broader audience because it's it, there's a lot of good information. And I'm getting asked some questions that are just uh, just really awesome questions. There are some people out there who aren't afraid to ask, and that's really I'm, – I'm, I'm really encouraged by that. It's really, you know – it's great to get those questions. You know, another thing you can do with this is you can actually, it's really just a, like a four item assembly, right? You've got a primary, you've got a, you've got a cutter and you've got a, you know, this, this uh, piped in this, you know, shell essentially. Um, all you have to do to change any of those forms there is just change the base polygonal shapes. And you can just use what's great about Moto and what really sets Moto apart from any other program on the market is just the simple cut, copy, paste features of polygons. So you could, copy or cut a semi truck out of another mesh item and paste it into the primary layer and now you're doing a shell operation on a semi truck or so i mean you it, yeah it's, it sounds simple that was one of the first things that i did in moto i just uh cut polygons away and copied them i'm still doing it today or cut and paste and it's it's really one of the first things that that drew me to moto it's yeah just, treating polygons almost like pixels and and it, it works with mesh fusion it works with this uh schematic uh, assembly you have right there so Something to keep in mind. So you could actually maybe even save out a simple assembly like that, and people could just go in and start messing with the uh, base shapes, just copying in their, you know, alien head or whatever, and kind of get an idea of how this stuff works without having to set it up from scratch. Yeah, absolutely. So this is something that yeah, it's a great idea, Greg. I'll pop this up on the uh, CloudShare site. So for the, okay. for, the uh, for the preset browser. Sounds um, good. So there's not a whole lot left. I'm, at this point, I'm just tweaking. Uh, you know, at, at this point, it's just all about form exploration. Like, what do I see? You know, a boat, uh, a shoe. Uh, you know, maybe like a a single seater car or something like that. This is just all where you you kind of tweak and then your imagination takes over. And a lot of times I'll just remember what I'm doing here and what works and what doesn't so that when I actually do have to make something, I'll say, oh yeah, remember that strange form that I made? That would actually fit perfectly into this, you know, this current task that I have to uh, that I have to model. Yeah. So what else do we have for Mesh Fusion in 11.2? I noticed there's a there's a performance update as well, correct? Oh yeah. There's a uh, well I don't have Moto open now, but yeah there's the uh, Actually, I forget what it's called, but it's it's a lot like the deferred update, but it will it will actually it, it's kind of like so a, the, like a the draft, draft, draft unions. Draft, draft unions. unions. Yeah. yeah, they're calling it draft unions, but it's it's essentially uh, if you have um, a scene with a lot of unions going on, uh, you can uh, uh, basically get a the visual feedback of unions like blended edges, but moving the items around very quickly without having to do all the calculations behind the scenes. So it's essentially just a it's just a sort of a transparent, much faster workflow. Does that sound about right, Andy? Yeah, kind of. If, if you if you have a, an object with maybe five um, five objects contributing to the primary, then if you move one of them, then it it, it kind of temporarily breaks the uh, the strip calculation. Mm. Um, for that for that join, and then you move it around, and then you edit another one. It does the same, and then you just reactivate it, and then it recalculates the uh, the strips when you're done. It's, so it's it's really perfect for if you're like. A more, yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry, Andy. Okay, well, around. I was just gonna say it's really perfect for when you're at the tail end of your design and you just want to make uh, like a like a last minute change, but you already have all of your strips set up. You can just toggle on. You can just uh, enable that, and then make your huge adjustments. And then when you disable it, your strips will come back to where they were. Moving items around. And if, you know, if you're not familiar with Mesh Fusion, strips are just sort of uh, beveled edges where two items come together. You have all kinds of controls for the slope of the strip and the width of it, the number of divisions, and all kinds of stuff like that in, in, in Mesh Fusion. And you can also, a lot of people work, the way they work is they just get their basic shapes together. Because strips can be uh, CPU intensive, you just turn strips on at the end and sort of fine tune it that way. But you know th this lets you continue to work. If you have your strips all set up and you don't want to turn it back off, this lets you move, you know, work quickly, sort of temporarily disabling them or working quickly. Um, there's also a, a rib trim assembly, which I should actually bring up some images here. I'll do that when Andy's chatting. But uh, we were talking earlier. We couldn't remember if the rib trim came out in 11.1 or 11.2. <laughs> I, I 
think it's 11 too. I think this is a new thing. Or it, it, you can cut, it, it's a, an assembly for using basically 2D profiles to do complex, um, you know, they call them rib trims. That's sort of, uh, if you look at my ceiling right there, <laughs> you could imagine uh, trying to cut that away um, using just a profile or a grid like that, cutting into a shape and then adjusting that those 2D uh, profile shapes um, and getting a really fast update. Anyway, the rib trim is really cool. And I'll look for some some images uh, that I could bring up here in a second. Yeah, yeah both, uh, both rib trim and elbow pipe are are new uh, this release. And then we had one additional last minute one that uh, Daryl had been working on uh, called uh, Flex Fuse um, that was also added in. So yeah, Flex Fuse is awesome. It's re that's that's going to be an incredible. That's I'm really excited for that one. What is it? That's an eleven two Flex Fuse. Yeah. So um, let's see if I could find that. They're like Go ahead procedural. And explain it and I'll try to find an image of it here. So they're okay, like procedural. So. They're like procedural primitives that have like bend built into them and taper and uh, and twist built into them. Uh, and they're just oh, okay. Daryl designed them so you can quickly just bash together mesh fusion uh, setups. But you can use them for anything just because they're just uh, subdivision surfaces. They're and so they're mesh operation items that, are, that that already have some mesh ops on there. Are probably assemblies that he created sort of package them up. And so you can uh, have some deformation options, you know, inside your, your already built into your uh, mesh fusion components. That's not totally. right. Yep. And then Daryl made all like this nice little UI for it, so you can just like enable things, disable things, um, kind of so you don't have to dig down into the properties. It's really cool. And one of the benefits of that is that um, because of the new uh, preset browser and the cloud assets, Daryl can just keep updating those and adding more, and uh, he doesn't have to wait until a point release to to update them. Oh, nice. So they're almost it, like uh, the little, what are, what are you, the qubits almost, but they're procedural qubits. Exactly. Yeah, they're like updated qubits. Nice. All right. Yep. Yeah. Updated qubits. Okay, so I will, um, Shane is looking for some images. I'll look for some images too. We'll get some stuff up there in a minute. But Andy, you want to take over and, and sure. go over a couple of the features? Okay, let me lock Andy in. You have the con. I'll share my screen. I, I too have a video. I hope it. Okay. Okay. Can everyone see? Yep. Modo. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I think there's some great stuff in 11.2. Um, the edge weight in the edge just showed. I think it's you know, fantastic. Just changes the game when uh, using mesh fusion. Um, and again, the uh, uh, the draft unions and how that uh, helps to kind of model. Uh, sorry how that helps to manage kind of scene complexity. Um, there's also, like, also some great UV, UVing stuff. Um, the thing I, I want to focus on is the bevel tool, uh, because we've put a, a lot of effort into improving it. Um, and I've, I've seen how many developer hours have gone into it. Um, and it, we've made some significant improvements. Um, before I go into I, kind of looking at exactly what we've done, I'd like to give everyone some kind of, well, I think, I think it's kind of interesting kind of background information to the bevel tool, because I've been talking to Taz a lot. Um, as, as a long time motor user, I find this, I find this interesting. Um, so we, uh, when we talk about the beveling, we always talk about the bevel tool. Um, and I can't imagine how many times I've kind of said that in a video, you know, hit B for the bevel tool. Uh, <laughs> but in, <laughs> but it, in reality, Modo has three bevel tools. So they've got, they've got vertex bevel, edge bevel, poly bevel. Um, and they run with the same hotkey based on you know, selection mode. Um, vertex, interesting, but interestingly, Vertex and Edge Bevel um, actually share the same, some of the same code. And they also share code with other tools like um, Edge Extend and, and Vertex, sorry, Edge Extrude and, and Vertex Extrude. But Polygon Bevel um, is actually a completely separate piece of code, a completely different tool. Um, like I say, these 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 bevel tools are written by Taz, and if you don't know who Taz is, um, he's kind of responsible for the majority of modeling uh, tools inside of Modo. So if you're a modeler um, making money using Modo, um, he's probably part of the reason why you have a career. And he's certainly part of the reason why I have a career. <laughs> Um, Long he's a, time, he's an absolute legend. Long time Modo developer, <laughs> yeah, behind the scenes, but he's been there for what over ten years, I'm guessing. And, uh, I, and Taz uh, does a great job being on the beta for all these years, listening to user feedback, edit, crowd a bunch of. I just want to real quick set setting the stage for this, Andy, because I know you guys put in a ton of work for this. Mm -hmm. 
there's been a ton of feedback on on uh, the Bevel Tools uh, lately because everybody's trying to get this right. Uh, there's been threads on the forums and Direct Connect. Uh, Ed has done a great job of trying to uh, pull all this feedback in from the various you know Slack groups and everything else, as well as the website and people he's talked to. Filtering it through Andy, getting it to Taz, and getting a feedback loop going to show what's basically a hugely improved tool, which you're going to uh, show us here right now. Yeah. Yeah, so, so what I'm trying to, trying to say is that these, these tools are actually written um, back for Moto 101, so like maybe 12 years ago. Um, and they actually, what Taz, Taz, Taz was telling me is it actually contains some of the um, oldest and most complex code inside of Moto. Um, and in fact, uh, Taz told me that the edge bevel tool is probably the most complex modeling tool from a code perspective in the entire application. Now, did he write the original um, one, or did Stuart Ferguson write that? He, he wrote it. He wrote yeah. it, OK. I think I think I think other developers had um, certain uh, input into some some bits of it. Um, again, it's, it's three tools, so it's not one tool. It's just different developers might have had different hands on it. Um, so, but basically, uh, so just remember next next time you bevel an edge, just remember there's a lot of stuff going on in there. There are massive <laughs> kind of blows my mind. <laughs> um, so let's take a, a look at what we do. I'm just going to play the video a little bit. Um, run through some of the features. Uh, so I'll start with the edge bevel tool. Um, we've got this uh, new mitering feature, which is a really useful um, option that kind of adds coplanar polygons uh, beside the outer edge of a beveled area. Um, so it's, and this is useful. I mean, in, in its simplest form, it's useful for something like creating shapes for mesh fusion. Although we've got edge weighting now, um, we still might want to do it this way. So we're going to start with a simple form. Um, it's going to be a sub-D object. We want to kind of hold those edges in place. And this is this is true of any kind of uh, um, sub-D modeling. So we've now got this red handle on the edge bevel tool, and that will just create those coplanar polygons for you. And sit there, and then just hit Shift-Tab, and everything's kind of held in place. Nice. Um, yeah. And it's also useful for doing things like controlling smoothing across the a, across a model. So in this example, if I, if I uh, bevel this edge and increase the rounding level, I think most motor modelers will come across this happening where you get this kind of smoothing error across a large polygon. A large smoother. Angle. Yeah, so you just pull the, pull the red handle, and it will fix it um, straight, straight away. So that's kind of like a geometric way of fixing, of fixing that. Um, but just to remind people, there's also a way of doing that on the material level. So we've got the uh, use polygon area option as well, which will fix it in that, that way as well. So we've got different options for that. Right. It's a useful, useful kind of improvement. Um, so the other uh, addition to the edge bevel tool is the maintain coplanar edges option. It's a really useful feature which fixes kind of beveling errors that can occur when uh, coplanar edges exist on, on an edge that you wish to bevel. Now, it doesn't kind of fix every situation uh, you might find yourself in, but it's a, a real godsend at times. So in this example, you may get these kind of coplanar edges when you bevel a polygon. Now, if you bevel that edge, you can see how you've, those edges are now not, not um, coplanar. They're on, running across that, that edge. So now in, in the um, in properties, you've now got this option for maintain coplanar edges, and you can see how it welds um, those oh, wow, okay. coplanar edges to the to the nearest non-planar edge. And, <laughs> and, and, it, if, and it fixes that. that, that and you know, these are the types of situations people who model all day yeah. bump into all the time. There's like in half a dozen situations. Uh, there's not a single model that comes out of hard surface model that comes out of any program that doesn't have edge beveling. And so it, it's a hugely important tool worth a huge amount of development effort because it's used on everything. And because it's so complex, like Andy said, there's a half a dozen situations that have been identified that can break the functionality of the tool that, like you just saw, would require the modeler to go back and manually fix those, those polygons that were made non-coplanar. Now it's just a checkbox. Yep. Yeah. So I've actually got an example here. So it, before we had that maintain coplanar option, I would have had to go in and select those edges, backspace, delete them, and then bevel. So you'd have to go in and sort of kind of like um, you always you always have to kind of like thinking a few steps ahead, <laughs> yep. kind of fix, fix make sure the geometry was was right for what you wanted to do. Uh, but now you know a lot of the times we can just fix it by by um, checking that box. Um, now, has that uh, feature made, is is also on the procedural version, the mop, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, mesh hop version of the tool as well, correct? If you use. Uh, uh, yes, it's, yeah, it's a, it's a mirror. 
Yep. Tools in so any improvement to the direct modeling tools also shows up in the if you're going to use that tool as a mesh operation. Yeah, well, that, not automatically. It still needs develop time. It doesn't happen. It's not magic, but it doesn't happen by magic. It's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna, it's gonna be, hopefully be there, right? So <laughs> yeah, so. that's the plan. So if this is a, a more complex situation, again, you got those coplanar edges that are sitting there. And if you want to build all this uh, more complex edge, again, you get that same uh, kind of kink in the edge, and it's even worse if you kind of add, add a rounding level. You get this kind of uh, pizza slice in the corner. Oh, those look familiar. Yeah. <laughs> You check, the, you check the box, and it and it fixes it. Oh, that's such a huge time saver without having to go in and, and fix those. Yep. Um, OK, so that's that's edge bevel. That's the edge bevel tool. So I'll move on to the uh, polygon bevel tool. Um, so there's a, I, I really love this feature. This is called um, square, square corner. Um, so it's useful in lots of situations. But for me, because I've done a lot of, kind of advertising work in the past, the first thing I thought of when I saw it was uh, labels on bottles. Now, because modeling a sub label on a bottle, you're always going to try to control the corners. Sometimes it can be tricky. Um, so in this example, my label, it gets to it. Here we go. So if I just bevel those polygons, you can see we've got this, uh, this square corner option there. If I just inset that, you can see in the top right-hand corner, we get that standard um, edge at 45 degrees. Uh, uh -huh. It checks square corner. It now creates a little quad in that corner. So we've now got topology that will really hold those corners in place. So now I can just kind of thicken, thicken that out. And we've got you know, the geometry that the geometry that we need. So it's a, you know, one again, checkbox, which saves kind of multiple edge slicing and edge removal that would have been we would have had to do in the past. Um, and this is another, another kind of example. Say I wanted to create kind of seams in a, in a uh, kind of like a, a seam with a T-junction in a piece of geometry. So I've saved those edges, I'll bevel them to create the, uh, the general area for the seam. Um, and then I'm going to invert the selection and I've, I'm going to use the polygon bevel tool with square corner on just to inset that. And that gives me those little square corners in there. Uh, originally, it would have given me that 45 degree um, edge, which in this case is not what I need. So now I can just use edge slice just to kind of fix that topology. Go back and select the uh, where that seam would be. I went down and now we got very quickly got really like kind of clean geometry for that uh, for that seam. Um, okay, so that's that square corner. Um, the next one is um, offset even. It is a, like a new option, which is on by default, um, and it ensures that the offset distance is maintained around the edge of a, of a, of a beveled area. So I've, I've select those polygons and I inset it. You can see that that new strip of quads is perfectly even all the way around. So even you know, the distance is the same all the way around. As you know, it's offset even is now on by default. If I turn it off, you can see that's that's what we would have got before. Right, and that's on by default now. Um, and that's on by default now. Um, so the great thing about it is it's because it's, it's a huge time saver because it reduces the need to kind of go back in there and fix things after the fact. And it, you know, it basically makes the polygon bevel tool work just much better. Yeah, um, and it, it, these are the type of things you're doing a thousand times on a model, and so they, it really adds exactly. up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the the one this is, and this is a lovely, lovely one it was one. It's called the uh, edge rail. It's an option for fixing kind of the kink that you can get on, on, on the border of a beveled area when you inset it. Um, so if I select these polygons here and inset them, we get that uh, strip of quads. Um, and you can see the kink, but what it's doing is it's main, maintaining the, uh, the edges so that they're perpendicular through that uh, strip of quads. But if we don't want the kink, what we'd have to do normally is go in there and start you know, so, you know, using the linear align to straighten them. Mm -hmm. Um, but now we've just got the edge rail tool, the edge rail option there, we just check that, and all those edges are straightened up for us automatically. Again, it's probably saving us like four or five steps in this case. So offset even, edge rail are gonna create just cleaner geometry with a with a checkbox click. Uh, exactly. rather than going back and doing it. Yeah. 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 I mean I, I I've used Moto since one oh one and I've kind of got used to 
um, like cleaning stuff up after I've done it with the bubble tool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you, you, you kind of get into the habit of doing that all the time. But now I'm kind of like thinking, well, that. I yeah, that. you're just that. your muscle memory. <laughs> you're just doing doing that you're, you're working around, uh, <laughs> encountering those situations, cleaning them up. So are there going to be videos on uh, Foundry site or on the forum or ad or put up just there's quite a few new features in, in the Bevel tools. And something like Edge Rail doesn't necessarily um, you know, tell you what it does. It's hard to describe what it does with just a couple of words in the tool in the tool properties panel. So are, are there some videos to help people you know, walk through some of the new features here? There are. There's uh, yeah, about, I believe about, about right. 25 quick clips for this release alone. Um, and those are on our Vimeo channel. Um, and I'll post a link in, I don't know if our chat goes to the public side, but I'll post a link here um, that you can add on, on the other chat window in the post for you. Okay, and those are on the Vimeo channel. Okay, so let's yeah. put a link up on Slack, Pixel Fun, do everywhere else to check out uh, Foundry. Is it the Vimeo, is the Vimeo channel Foundry or Moto? Is it that if you're searching it's, for it? It's the Moto, Moto Geeks channel. Moto Geeks Vimeo channel, okay. So we'll, we'll link to that. Album. Or there's two different albums. There's a Quick Clips album, and then there's a Moto uh, 11.2 Quick Clips that are all the recent ones. Um, and there, yeah, there's 25 videos in that album right now. All right, um, there's I mean, a lot more features than just that. I mean, we've only talked about a few different things, you know, here today. But there's, uh, you know, literally, you know, hundreds of just different tweaks and bug fixes and things like that that went into this release alone. Um, and just a long list of other regular feature development that we were able to do in, in this cycle. Andy, did you have something else you wanted to show? Uh, yeah, just one. There's one more, one more thing. I actually, I actually really like this one. Um, so we've added the thicken option. So how, how many times have you beveled a polygon and then realized you needed, needed the original poly <laughs> polygon left in place? So in, in my case, it's like all the time. <laughs> and now we, if we, if we uh, do a bevel, and you see it's open, an open edge. You go into uh -huh. properties, you just check second polygon, and now it's a closed. Oh, there we go. That's and this nice. is really useful, <laughs> really useful when you're doing procedural modeling. Yes, um, procedural absolutely. Modeling. So, for example, I, you know, I did a table model I demonstrated a few months back, and I ran into this exact same problem um, because I couldn't I couldn't leave the original polygon behind. I had to come up with some kind of convoluted approach to achieving the same thing procedurally. Uh, but now I've just got it here. It's got the cube, which I've uh, kind of beveled the edge. I'll run a polygon bevel. A lot of content in there. That'll give me some uh, and a profile there. You can see if I, if, I go, if I go underneath, you can see if it's it's, a, it's an open object. Uh -huh. um, so now I can just go into the procedural version and just say polygons, and now it's a closed object. Boom! Yeah, that's a huge, huge help in procedural really modeling. Like yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so next, twelve point oh. Let's get some segments in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's that's kind of like where, where we are with the bevel tool at the moment. Um, I'll just like the, the bevel tools. Um, but yeah, like like I got to stress that this certainly isn't the end of the story. And, you know, we're, we're continuing to fix issues because we know there are still issues, and um, we'll also look to kind of make improvements as and when that fits into the kind of the broader goals of the release. But like I said, this is a complex co code with a lot of dependencies, so we have to kind of be careful how we do it and get it right. Um, but I think we've, I think we're in a right model now with the releases, like uh, you know, multiple releases um, through the year. That we can kind of keep chipping away at these things, and hopefully make these tools better. And yeah, better. I think what you know what Andy's saying, and he, he sort of started this off is you know, there's multiple tools in Moto that depend on the code of the Edge Bevel tool, which is one of the oldest tools in Moto, like a dozen years old, probably older than some of the people using Moto. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Possibly, you can't just a. It's hard to go. Even if you wrote it, like I load up just scenes I did a couple of years ago. I can't figure out what the hell I did in them. <laughs> and so going back and improving foundational tools that are a dozen years old is hard, and it's not sexy, and it's not like something you like splash out on the web page. Hey, everybody, we got a new bevel. We improved the bevel tool. But the fact is, it's the most used tool in the program for a lot of people. And it, it, it's, I love it that you guys went back, took the time. And Taz, uh, you know, if you're watching, <laughs> thanks for doing that. I'm sure it's a huge pain in the ass. And knowing that it's going to continue to be improved. Um, and like Andy said, you have to be careful because you could break things if you if you go back and just sort of jump in. People, I, I'm sure, I know I'm, I'm one of them. are like, can't you just fix the damn, like, edge beveling? Like, and uh, so it's nice, a huge amount of work going into this, uh, a lot of community input. Um, 
you know, if they miss something, then let's bring it up and let's give a bunch of examples and 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 keep hammering on it because these are the tools. These uh, use it a thousand times per model tools um, that make Moto what it is. Why people use it because they're it's very fluid. Hit B, do your bevel, no matter what component mode you're in. And uh, anyway, so it's great to see those those uh, fixes there. One of the things I wanted to bring up though, that we haven't talked about is there is a new shading model in Moto eleven point two. Uh, for rendering, all you rendering geeks out there, you're not left out. There is the, uh, based on the Disney uh, shading model, correct, Shane, is the, yeah, I actually, um, I, <laughs> I forgot the, we, we weren't allowed to actually call it a certain name. Um, well, you're calling it the principal The shader. principal shader, yes, because this right. is what it was actually called internally at Pixar now. Um, but yes, so uh, we have a new BD BDRF, um, uh, shading model called the principal shader. It is based on the Disney paper um, that was developed by somebody very important that I can't remember the name of. <laughs> <laughs> Walt Disney. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so yeah. So that that's uh, another addition on the rendering side. Um, there was other. There's quite a bit of other little. Again, you, you know, I, I have that. Oh, because I was playing with it last night. Do you want me to show that real quick? That'd be great. That, yeah, go yeah. for it. Let me see if I can do that. Lock me in. We'll put you on the demo spot. Yeah. <laughs> share, share my screen. Okay. So you see my. Yeah, that's you see one that? ones we didn't actually talk about a whole lot in the, the marketing materials. Um, yeah. It's kind of scanning stuff. Oh, okay, yeah. There it is. The principal BDRF shader based on Brent Burley of Walt Disney Animation Studios. Brent Burley. All right. Shout out to Brent. So what's interesting about this is you'll see it um, over here. There's just a drop down where I can typically start. They're physically based. It has the older energy conserving and traditional versions from uh, older versions of Moto. But you could just pick the principal shader right now. And one of the things I think people will like about it is it has a, a metallic percentage. So this is similar to the PBR shading you'll see in Unity or Unreal Engine, or Marmoset, or even uh, over in uh, some of the substance things. So you have this, I'm not sure if I've got my wife here, let me turn down um, uh, roughness to zero, so you can kind of see the difference between, if I have metallic set at zero, let me push in here, and oh, I have a bump map on there, let me just screwing around, and I'm also in the wrong thing, the torus here, let me turn uh, metallic to zero. And so there's with metallic off, right? And kind of rough when we just sort of knock the roughness down. But when you crank up metallic, you don't have to go in and uh, add a specular color similar to your diffuse color. Um, you just up the metallic slider and it makes it metallic. Right? Essentially turning the reflection is similar to the diffuser blending that in. And you can have a tint there as well. You can work off the refractive index like you're, you're, you know, like an octane material or something like that. And uh, of course, you got roughness, sheen, sheen tint, flatness. I believe that's more for fabric type materials. So we have that in there as well. I know the way it calculates Fresnel is different. So I can up the roughness on this quite a bit like that. And then I can turn up, uh, it has a clear coat channel. So I can crank up clear coat 200% to get some sharp reflections on top of the uh, really uh, blurry reflections there. If I crank up roughness some more, you can see the, the tight clear coat on top of that. So you have really sharp reflections on top of the blurry ones. And uh, yeah, the metallic one. So you know, there's a few other differences in there. Um, but just with one channel, you can go from, you know, which I think is, is pretty cool. Some people are going to like to use this shader uh, because it's more similarly, 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 similarly. Is that a word? I think I got that. I think so. uh, mimics. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, the PBR type materials that a lot of people use data. Yeah. So, so there's that. So I will stop my sharing. It's but, a pretty uh, common uh, BDRF model um, that, yeah, like you said, a lot of people are probably becoming more familiar with. Um, so Absolutely. Uh, okay, so we've got a few questions over here. Um, so rendering. Somebody wants to <laughs> let's talk more about rendering. Uh, well, actually, let's talk a little more about rendering because you said within a month the... Um, maybe we'll, we'll give we'll give you to the new year, but you know maybe a month uh, we'll see the uh, AMD Pro Render um, version come out that we can play with the GPU rendering in Moto. Uh, but the bigger picture in that that's interesting to me is that you're actually kind of creating a third party rendering API to integrate third party renders, where previously something like V-Ray or Octane has sort of had to work with what you had or maybe create some of their own um, uh, code to integrate more with Moto. So with right. this API chain. If a third-party renderer, let's say Redshift, 
Redshift wants to come over to Modo, um, can they, will this API let them use traditional Modo materials or the shader tree to work within their renderer? Like V-Ray uh, does. It, yeah, it does. And, and V-Ray uh, and Octane and others that have integrated so far, um, most of them are using the Render Cache API, uh, which was a new API that was developed around, uh, I want to say, 901 or 9 series. Uh, it started around there. And we've, you know, we've continued to improve it. Um, and what we're working on right now is, uh, in, the, in the past, it was really, um, it was only capable for production rendering, so regular render window uh, or frame buffer rendering. It wasn't uh, really capable of interactive rendering, so preview rendering uh, and things like that. So uh, Neb, or our developer on the project, has been uh, re reworking pieces of uh, the Render Cache API, uh, bringing it you know, more up to date, um, and working on just improving in general uh, how preview connects uh, to Moto. So preview has is, is been kind of similar to regular Moto render, but also different in a lot of ways. Um, so we've been uh, kind of under the hood re-architecting a lot of that stuff. Um, and the AMD Pro render gives us an opportunity to kind of, kind of fork that code, if you will, and allow us to develop that new preview render API um, on the new renderer. Uh, without destroying everything that was already done with previews. So preview will kind of continue on using the legacy code path that it's using for right now until we can get feature parity and get everything working uh, with a new API, and then and hopefully we'll, we'll merge the two together. Uh, but for the users, there's really no feature gain um, in the preview render. What you gain is just more third-party accessibility with you know, things like the render Render Pro Render and, and others that want to come on board with Moto. So, so are you, let me just see if I hear you right. Will you be able to use Moto's preview window to preview other renderers besides the Moto renderer? Yeah, so like today, um, I believe like Chaos Group to do their preview rendering. Uh, they've had to develop their own, you know, their own preview render window to do that. They didn't use any of the existing architecture to do that. Um, so this would enable other, it just makes that process a lot easier for third parties to do their integration in Moto. There'll be more of, uh, you know, more of a standard way to do that uh, with the SDK uh, than there is today. Right, so making things easier for third party renderers means more support from third party renderers. Yeah, hopefully we see a lot yeah. more come on board. You know, I think, um, you know, there's, there's been a lot happen uh, in that ecosystem around Moto in the past two to three years. Uh, and the third-party community is really thriving around Moto these days. Yeah, and the preview window is to a uh, artist, a rendering-focused artist like the edge bevel <laughs> is to a modeler. Yeah. I mean, it's the essential tool that you're using constantly. And, and Moto has a really good preview window. I really like it, especially one of the things I like about Moto is you can open up multiple preview windows and set them to different channels and, and really analyze your uh, a renderer that way. Um, okay, so we've got, uh, so we see AI service very fast. I'm just kind of looking at chat here. I would be remiss if I did not bring up Moto Indie. It has been a month, <laughs> two. Any traction on that front? Uh, we're still working through, I would say, um, kind of the back end logistics around that. Uh, we do intend to update it, uh, you know, as we stated before. Um, we are compiling now. It, it always comes into you know, the problem where we get to the end of the cycle of the regular mainline product, um, and we're finally ready to go with Indie, and it becomes a decision of, well, do we just wait a couple weeks and, and recompile the latest version of Moto rather than releasing 11.1 on the Indie platform? So um, we're kind of at that point again. We're at those crossroads again, um, and we're going to spin up 11.2 on the Indie platform and, and hopefully release that. Um, but we still need to go through a few kind of uh, sign-offs on it internally. You know, Derek and I have been working a lot on, on how Indie plays a, a much bigger role in the long-term strategy for the product overall. Uh, and that, that's kind of more important to us, at least, um, in making it much more of a viable tool to, to building you know, building the moto base, if you will, longer term. Yeah, yeah I, was, 
I know like I mentioned this last time and I know people are like, just get on with it already. And I, yeah. I, I understand their frustration, believe me. Uh, but really it comes down to, we need to align it with our overall strategy for, for, for next year. There's a couple other products coming online um, potentially that tie into our strategy. So we're getting close and, and I, I do appreciate people's patience, but I will say we, we are, I think, getting close to the finish line on basically a decision. And then once the decision's made, I don't think we'll have the same problems all the time. We'll basically have, this is where we're going with the product. This is how it fits in the moto. This is how it fits into the kind of the whole ecosystem where we're going. And then that's just kind of, kind of that. And so I think it's just a matter of getting, once the overall strategy is aligned here in the next few uh, weeks, I don't think we'll have the kind of constant churn on, on the top. Like it'll just be something that we have out there that we support that fits into Moto, that fits into a, an, an upgrade path potentially. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of where that, that stands today. Okay, uh, quick question for Andy. You, you demoed the, in the material properties the new smooth by surface area to fix the vertex normal issues. Can that be baked? Will that a, a property be baked if you bake out a map? I don't know. You do not know. All right. Ed, get on that. <laughs> Stop that out. Right. Exactly. I'll figure it out. That's a video. video. The great question for <laughs> <Yeah>. the <Mano> concierge. <laughs> Come on, man. That sounds like it would be very helpful if it could. You just click a button, fixed, bake. Yeah, I'll give it a shot. Right. I'll try it right after, right after this. Yeah, I'll I think if, if you can, we will see. If okay. you're going to bake it as a normal map, then it'll come across as a normal map. I right. You know, somebody asked if uh, the deferred updates from Mesh Fusion will make it over to MeshOp Booleans, which are a completely different sort of mesh operations. It's a completely different system within Moto, but the concept of deferred updates on a, a Boolean is nice. Now, with MeshOps, you can, of course, just eyeball it off and and to turn you know to to, to turn off the evaluation. Um, but is there going to be? Well, actually, let me, let me just broaden the question out. There has been work done on uh, the booleans and the mesh operations. Now you can forward on the uh, new data created by a mesh operation boolean, like the new edges or the new polygons created, as a uh, selection operation. So if I boolean, if I do a solid drill of a star shape into a, a plane, I can then forward that star shape up the chain as a selection operation to say a set material modifier and color that star pink. So those, uh, me the mesh operations have been improved in 11.2 and, and those yeah. are really important actually. Uh, we didn't touch on them. Um, but Andy, uh, are these gonna continue to be worked on as Boolean operations are becoming, uh, you know, again, back in style as a modeling, uh, uh, well, style, I guess, or a modeling um, workflow. Do you see, you know, continued work on the Boolean operations in mesh ops? Yeah, well, generally the whole mesh up thing we'll continue with going forward. It's just we've got to get as much as as much of Modo into into mesh ops as we can. Um, I've got I've got a long list of tools that I want to go want to get in there. A long list of tools yeah. going to mesh ops. Yeah, there was there's another one. I think you can yeah. set polygon. <laughs> so again, a, a small one, but a big one. You can set polygon type in mesh operations now, so you can change yep. yeah, yeah, you can, you, sub D or. It's like having it's like having shift tab go in. Yep. So Procedural, procedurally, you can model, you can create your mesh operation stack and polygons at the very end. Slap on a convert to Catmull Clark at the top, and boom, you know, you got it. You could toggle that on. But you're, you're right. You're right about those selection uh, new selection modes. That select by previous modes. Yes. To, to, to different tools, and that, that 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 really opens it up a lot more because you were kind of restricted by you know index selections. Um, a lot of the time before, but now it's more about the selection. You can define the selection based on what happened on the previous tool and what was generated by the previous tool. And it just, it's, it, it will gradually make it easier and easier to, to get stuff right. made. Right. Now, somebody is asking, and I'm not sure what, you know, if you can't talk about future development, that's fine, but I'm just going to ask a question. Is somebody is asking about updating the engine behind Moto's UI, just the, you know, general UI experience in Moto? I believe it is a, is it's, it's QT now, right? And, 11.2, is there work being done on Moto's UI just to modernize it? It's QT, um, but it's not It's not what would be considered, Moto's not what would be considered a true QT app application. Um, so yeah, it is something that's a big, big project kind of behind the scenes um, that we kicked off uh, almost a good 18 months ago. So this is a, a really uh, long-term, uh, very extensive, 
uh, re-architecture that's been going on to make Moto a true QT application. Um, and this will enable us to really go back to the Nexus framework model and leverage Nexus, which is the core of Moto, uh, to do much more than just, just Moto at the end of the day. So we can spin up a lot of other applications off of the platform uh, more easily and, and continue to, to further the technology throughout the Foundry tools. Um, so that's, that's a, a, you know, a big horizon thing that's out there a ways, uh, but it is something that we are uh, working on um, behind the scenes. It, it'll take quite a bit of time before it actually uh, has any real benefit to a Moto user. Uh, one of the key things behind it, it, it'll finally give us high DPI support. Um, so I know that's a much anticipated thing. It's a big pain point for anybody on a 4K monitor, uh, which is becoming obviously much more common today. Um, but uh, unfortunately, that's going to take uh, you know a bit more time to get there before we're ready for that. Right. So Moto UI is being worked on. This is a long-term project. This is a it's a big project, is what I'm guessing. Yeah. Uh, but it is we'll a year uh, investment to to get it even to a point where it equates to high DPI support. It's just yeah. doing the exact same UI that is in Moto today, but at high DPI. But yeah, it will obviously unlock a lot of opportunities uh, in terms of what we can do with the UI that we're somewhat limited to do today. But yeah, that would not be something that would be in the in the near term, i.e. next one or two releases. Right. Point, point, point releases, we're referring to there. Right. Yeah. So, but coming. So let's see. We've got, so yeah, I hope that answers the question about the UI. I think you'll probably be seeing a little more on that. Um, Next year, uh, yeah, as we get is... out of the twelve series, we'll hopefully have a point where we can at least get it in more of an alpha state, or you know, hopefully beta. You know, who knows, public beta. Um, but you're looking at really probably late thirteen series, um, or you know, best case kind of scenario. And, and again, I mean, as it's going through, you know, that stuff will get pushed out to um, you know people that are that are current on subs or maintenance and out through the. Uh, the beta system. So people will have an ability to kind of sneak peek a lot of that stuff. Well, let's talk about maintenance real quick. I have a couple other questions I want to get to, but I don't want to miss this. Like, so if you were to get Moto 11.2 right now, like I just get it, I, do you have act, what, what does that mean in terms of subscription? Do I, do I have to, do I get 12 if it comes out in six months or how does yeah, that work? I mean, that's, I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. it's a, it's a key thing right now because now is really, if you've been on the fence, now is, is a great value play for you to upgrade right now. Because uh, in the past, if you upgraded at this time of year, then you know you spent your 495 and you got all of what you know came out throughout the year. It was you know, you know, fair value, right? There's been a lot released so far this year. You're getting a big boost, especially if you're coming from 901. You get all the 10 series. You're getting you know six releases. Um, so not only do you get all of that, but if you upgrade right now, you're going to get the next 12 months of updates. So, uh, you know, that will almost most definitely include some, if not most of the 12 series. So you're not only getting all of the 11 series, but you're going to get a fair chunk of the 12 series as well. So you get, right. So you get, uh, so basically it's, this is a good time to make the leap. Yeah, you're, yeah. you're, like, you're kind of getting a two for one special right now without us doing any type of promo or any special deal around that. It's just inherently built in by us switching to a maintenance model uh, type of uh, pricing, you know, at this time of year. Yeah, I mean, so in that respect, maintenance and subs work the same, is that you're basically getting 12 months of updates, regardless of which one you are. On the one, obviously, you get to keep what, what you're current with. The other one, once you stop paying, you lose it. But yeah, I mean, this is the whole idea of, you know, talking about the bevel improvements, right? In the past, I think the issue was, you know, you, you looked at a release and you said, oh, they, don't, they didn't fix this particular part of, of the code. I'm going to wait a year, right? And there's really no reason anymore to do that, because in the case of bevel, for example, we may do, you know, do six or seven enhancement requests in or or you know feature changes in this version we might do one or two in 12.0 we might do you know three or four more in 12.1 so we're constantly kind of rolling through both um you know fixes enhancement requests new features and you're just going to be getting that the whole time right so there's no there's no sort of benefit to kind of waiting for some you know next big thing because if you get it now you're going to get the 12.0 the 12.1 you're just going to get those constant updates and so um you know that's why i think once people kind of get their head around what the current model is it's a much better way in terms of our ability to kind of deliver that value point to point and then for the end user to kind of roll in those updates um kind of into their workflow as they're ready 
Which makes sense. Uh, 3D modeling and animation is a long-term commitment from anybody who's using it. So if you're going to jump into it, you know, you're in it, you're kind of in it for a year anyway, or the long haul. So it's nice to know that, okay, I don't have to worry about making up to date decisions. Everything that they develop and release is coming to me. And I'm just going to incorporate it as, as I'm going. Um, you can also check it out in the betas that you guys release. One of the things I want to ask Andy and, and Ed is we get a number of looking at questions. And a lot of questions is about specific mesh ops. Is this mesh op going to be released? Is this mesh op going to be released? Like a set polygon mesh op, they're just sort of basic functions and modos. So if somebody had asked about a split vertices poly, uh, mesh op. You know, that's really, you combine a split vertice with a push mesh op, and you can do some cool motion graphics stuff. So is there a place, maybe Ed or Andy, that people can say, you know, these are the mesh ops we want to see? Can you, you know, the three or four that come converted over every version, can we maybe upvote these or make our case for why something like split vertices, which may be under the radar, is actually really important? Well, I have my own personal um, list, which goes to the top. So that's just, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, uh, you know, anything, if anybody mentions anything on the getting started section of the Foundry forums or just in general, I'll, if they even um, just tag me or, or email me directly, I'll, I'll make a note of it and make sure it gets in front of the right, uh, the right eyes. So, yeah, it might be nice to see just a sort of, um, you know, even just like a list and, and like a sort of uh, one or two sentence case for why that's a good mesh op to bring over. Uh, there's a bunch of them in there, but like set polygon again, that's super. It, it, you don't notice it's missing until you notice it's missing because you need it, and there's no alternative. There's no real workaround well, for do, it, right? Do you know? Do you know the one that got me, Greg? It, which is in eleven point two flip. Ah, flip, yeah. flip yeah. polygon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> flip F. <laughs> that. And some mesh operations had uh, flip sort of built into the mesh op, like extrude and, and some things like that, in case you bumped into it. But it's a super important um, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, tool that you use in, in direct modeling that you know can maybe be overlooked in, in, as a mesh op. So yeah, so you know, maybe making a list and maybe we maybe Pixel Fondue can do something, or maybe we could do like a top ten or something like that. But uh, as Moto be becomes great. starts offering uh, you know procedural modeling on equal grounds to direct modeling. Um, it might be nice to sort of bring those over. Uh, okay, so I'm just kind of glancing. It's been about an hour, a little over an hour, glancing at the questions. I think we're, I think we're sort of questioned out. Anything else we wanted to bring up before we call it a wrap? Tell people to put out the links and go download their 11.2. Is so, the demo is the demo out? Yeah, go get the trial. I mean, that's the yeah. biggest thing. Uh, it's so hard, and I say this every time. It's so hard to put the words behind all of all of the improvements that go into each release. There's a lot of stuff there. Uh, go grab the trial. Go grab the release notes. You know, dig in. You know, do your do your own evaluation before you take somebody else's opinion on on the forum for things. And you know, give it a play. It's free. You get free thirty days of of Moto three times a year now. So, you know, go have at it. Yeah, I I, I want to echo that. You know, I do see that the, the forums and people. You know, they'll they'll ask a question and they'll someone will answer it. It might not be right. The, the trial's free. Ed's there to help you. Uh, before you ask anybody else uh, necessarily a question, I would I would trust Ed to give you uh, the you know the right answer. Uh, he's there to help you. Also, we're running monthly contests on Facebook uh, now. Basically, Ed's doing a great job of kind of picking something fun to do each week. Uh, he'll, I'll let him talk about what he's doing next. Um, but and we give away a subscription uh, to Moto each month uh, for someone to do it. So it's a great way. If you're curious, if you've been off Moto for a while, or if you haven't used Moto, download the trial. You can enter the contest. It's super fun. It'll help you out. We've gotten a lot of great um, you know, feedback from it. Some really fun art is being created with it. And so we're really trying to get people to just you know, get out there and try it and have fun with it and play with it. And Eddie, I don't know if you want to talk about the next, uh, the next contest. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm sharing my screen. Can you see this image? It says uh, the Moto Movie Prop Contest. Yep. Uh, okay, great. Yeah, so uh, we're running a monthly contest. Um, this month will be uh, Movie Prop. Uh, so just any prop, if it's a, a lightsaber, Indiana Jones's fedora, you know, anything you can think of. Uh, it'll be until November 30th. That's when all the submissions must be in by. And uh, first place, we'll get a subscription to uh, Moto, an annual subscription. So, so Ed, is this open to just Moto users, or is it any 3D program? The last contest was uh, just it had to it had to use Moto at least in some way. Um, I don't know, maybe, yeah. So uh, maybe Shane, do you want to speak on whether we want to 
uh, keep it that way. We're not well, sure. Well, my thought is you're giving away a free Moto subscription, you know, have some, like there might be somebody who's a Ace Maya model or ZBrush model or wants to like create a movie. I like, look, man, I want Moto. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make, uh, you know, Luke's lightsaber and get it. <laughs> I would I would encourage them to download a trial and find how easy it is to make it in Moto. Yeah. It's a free trial and and I think they'll be surprised how quick they can get it uh, get up to speed. Download and as as someone who votes on the props, I'm not saying so much make the staff of Raw, but you could and it might help you win. I'm just <laughs> I'm just putting that out there. The staff of Ra. Yes. Wait, what was that from? Like uh, and yeah, from the first All oh, right. Yes. <laughs> Why was I thinking like but, that? But you have to show it with the light coming through. and uh, <laughs> Right. And a face melting. Uh, right. No, but it's really, I mean, it's been really fun to kind of see the entries we get. And uh, yeah, like I said, I mean, it's going to be a different, a different one each month. And so I really recommend people check out the Facebook page. Also, uh, Ed's been doing a great job of putting out uh, great artwork uh, on Instagram, on Facebook of people. If you have assets, you're, you're doing cool stuff in Moto. By all means, please send it to us, share it. We, we'll put it out there. Uh, some of the posts we're really getting great traction on. It's really great sometimes just to, you know, there's no, uh, there's no, there's no catch, there's no sell. It's just we want to show people the, the artwork that's being made in Moto. So by all means, I encourage you to put it out there uh, through our social uh, media and we'll, we'll get the word out on some of the great artists that are out there uh, using Moto. Can somebody yeah, if you, if you, if you do have a website... Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. Ed, can you give me the Facebook link? I'm going to send it to the live chat and tweet it real quick, and then people will share it around. Sure, sure. Sorry about that. Uh, real quick, somebody keeps asking about um, uh, 3D Studio Max symmetry in in Moto. So here's what I'm here's what I'm going to suggest for that is if you're a Max user and a Moto user and you like how Max does symmetry, do a quick video, send it to Ed. He's going to look at it. He's going to wrap his head around it, and he's going to show it to a Andy or developer who who works on symmetry, and they're going to see you know if, if it makes sense. So um, I think that's the sort of pipeline we get for uh, feature requests um, because like I just like I just like I have 3D Studio Max, and like if you ask me, is Moto going to have 3D Studio Max symmetry? I'm just like, I don't, well, I don't even know what that means. I'm not sure what the difference is. So you know, again, like go in depth a little bit, make a video, explain why it's good, get it to Ed, and Ed will. Put it up the chain, maybe even uh, up to Andy or somebody like that. So, okay, sorry, Ed. Go ahead. With no, that. and also you can just you can email me at ed ferrari at foundry com. So it's pretty ed. easy to remember. Ferrari at yep. foundry com. Ferrari so, like the car, right? Yep, exactly. Yep. I think I think we need a concierge at foundry com email. <laughs> uh, sorry, did you send the link? I was going to put that. Oh, up. yeah, it's there. It's right above. I just sent it. Uh, it's, it's, over, it's over on the right. Oh, is there a chat window? Yeah. Yeah. There it is. Okay. All right. I will send the link out. And um, okay. Anything else said about the contest? Yeah, it, it, only if you uh, just to carry on with what uh, Derek was saying. If you uh, supply an image or whatever, and you want me to uh, just give your website a plug or your art station page or your Behance page, I'll include that when I when I post on it. So you know, great. Just make sure to include that. All right. Fantastic. We'll be putting that out. Um, do you mind if I throw your email up there? Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, 3D Studio Max Symmetry Guy. Sorry, I lost your name in well, there. Uh, I'm not trying to be rude. I'm just trying to read 50 things at once. But here's but, uh, Ed's email. Make a video, send it to Ed, and he will respond because he is the yep. customer. Go ahead, Shane. Well, we do also have the generic e inbox for um, Moto Help, oh, yeah. um, which might be just an easier one to remember. It's just moto.help at foundry.com. Uh, and that'll actually go to uh, myself, Ed, uh, Derek. Uh, and a couple of others, but Ed's primarily the one responding and uh, answering the the help questions there. Excellent. Okay. Uh, I think I, I just want, I just want to uh, can I just reiterate what Derek said about how great it is to see uh, work that's done by people because um, I'm always uh, checking Facebook and some of the images that come up. Um, they just make it's just great to see uh, amazing work that's done by the artists who use Moto because. Like I, I'm kind of looking at Moto from a, like a, um, a product, and the coders are looking at it as kind of in, in terms of code and bugs and trying to fix things. But at the end of the day, when you can look at a fantastic image and think, "Oh, look at that! That's that was made by." Uh, mm. What well, really, really makes everyone feel really good. Like I saw, I saw a um, a brilliant model of a, of a, a mesh boolean uh, mammoth that was made recently, and it was just incredible. 
I'm just, I'm, I showed it to my wife. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> yeah, I'll have to get that. So do you see more images? Because you had mentioned that mammoth, but that well, sounds like that was posted on Facebook. I usually check the gallery on the forum. Is uh, there I, a lot of stuff on Facebook? Yeah, was, yeah I think I people post stuff on Facebook. Yeah, there's Facebook, uh, Instagram. We see a lot of traffic. Um, you know, just tag, tag either one of our, you know, um, at Foundry Moto uh, feeds or or Pound um, Made with Moto. We kind of pick up and watch a lot of those different things, um, and you know, kind of pluck them out. We see stuff on the gallery as well. Ed promotes things from there. Um, I don't know. You you pick them up from all over the place, right, Ed? I do, yeah, mostly the gallery. Uh, if you just go to Art Station and type in Moto, a lot of uh, work done in Moto comes up. They have a pretty yeah. good search engine. So, yeah, there is. In fact, there's a Russian artist in there. Maybe it's the guy who made the mammoth. But there's it is. A guy, yeah. Is he the guy who did the sub D weapons that are like mind blowingly complicated? Probably, yeah. The guy named uh, Sergey Tiapkin. I have to find that because I actually want to track that guy down. Because I, I, I added it in the uh, chat, so it's there. Oh, okay, it is there. So let me let me post that up to, for everybody. Um, all right. Oh, there, wait, it is the, the top one up there at the very top there. Oh no, PXN twenty three. Where's the chat with the? Uh, I see the your blue, the blue icon. I I posted it uh, a few posts ago. It's above it's above Shane's. Uh, oh, in the live post. chat. I was looking at our chat. No, it is in our chat. Yes, oh, we'll our chat. there. Why don't I get that? I don't see it. <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm left out. I'm feeling very left out. The last thing I oh, see no. is uh, moto.help uh, foundry. Yeah, I got it. There you go. Uh, oh, there it is. Okay, so let me post that uh, to you guys over here in the live group and share that around. I'll tweet that out. Um, all right, so I think we can wrap up. I think uh, I love the Made with Moto campaign. I think maybe we just, you know, I, I, I would like to just do a uh, Pixel Fondue um, artist showcase. So maybe we'll do that uh, in, in Ed or... Andy, you see some cool stuff. Let's collect some things together, try and do a little bit of an artist showcase and do some more artist interviews over on Pixel Fondue and um, you know, interact with the community that way. Uh, uh, Pixel Fondue news. I think we'll have a new roundtable shortly. We are looking for contributors familiar with Substance, Substance designer, Substance painter. And I think we're going to get some more stuff on that. We've got a new contributor coming on shortly that does a lot of work, uh, nodal work with um, all, all apps, Houdini, Lightway, uh, Moto, uh, everything else, and sort of a generalized uh, pipeline tool. We've got some new uh, videos up there by Lucas, uh, the advanced character uh, studio creator. Um, and I think that's about it. So I'm going to go jump into 11.2 a little bit because I just started playing with the last <laughs> night. All right. All right, guys, have a good week. Uh, week. It's not really the weekend. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe not. Cool. All right. Cool. Cool. All right. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, cool. yeah, thanks, thanks everyone. Thanks, bye. -bye. Mm -hmm. hey. <clears throat>